Hello, John Perry here. You are watching the Stated Casually channel. The other day, I decided to visit the beach, and I noticed that once I hit damp sand, I could feel things hitting my feet in the air every time I took a step. A close look revealed what, as a kid, I used to call sand fleas. The critters that I thought were sand fleas are more commonly called sand hoppers, and I like that name much better because first off, they don't actually bite like fleas do, and second, fleas jump with their legs. You can read all about that in this paper from the Journal of Experimental Biology. It's open source, and there is a link to the article in the video description, so go check that out if you feel like it. Sand hoppers, on the other hand, they do not use their legs to jump. Instead, they use a very different appendage, one that completely gives away their evolutionary history. You are watching Evidence for Evolution in your own backyard, Beach Edition. The beach is sort of close to my backyard. Well, it's about a 50 minute drive, but close enough. Cut me a little slack, I didn't feel like redoing the branding of this entire series just because of this one episode. So, Beach Edition. Sand hoppers are also sometimes called sand shrimp because, at least to my untrained eye, they look exactly like tiny little shrimp and they live in the sand, so makes sense. They're actually not shrimp though, they are amphipods, a large group of shrimp-like creatures that normally live in the ocean. Telling amphipods and shrimp apart is actually easier than you might think. You have two main options. You can either count their legs, Shrimp are decapods, just like crabs and lobsters, and the vast majority of species have ten legs, five on each side if you count their little pinchers. Or, better yet, just check to see if they have a carapace. The carapace is that long, shield-like structure that extends back behind a shrimp's head. Amphipods don't have a carapace. Shrimp. Amphipod. Shrimp. Amphipod. Shrimp. Amphipod. You get the picture. The reason that I love sandhoppers, aside from the obvious fact that they are both adorable and evil jerks to each other for apparently no reason. <laughs> See what I mean? Check out this guy, he's gonna get kicked in the face. <laughs> Just for trying to be friendly, it's so heartbreaking. The reason that I love sandhoppers is that they are a perfect example of a modern transitional species. I mean, technically, you could say that all species are transitional. Humans, for example, evolved from non-human apes, and I guess if all goes well, we will eventually give rise to several new species in the future, but sandhoppers are extra transition-ish. That's a new technical term that I just came up with. They're extra transition-ish because they are currently transitioning from life in the ocean to life on dry land, and that is a big, big deal. Usually when a sea critter washes up onto shore, it dies. Even many crab species, which have these nice hard exoskeletons that are both good for supporting their weight on land and for holding water in, even many crab species don't do well out of water. Kelp crabs like this one can sometimes be okay if they find a nice uh, damp place under a rock to hide, but when I found this little guy, he was, he was dying, unfortunately. Possibly from too much exposure to the sun and dry air. Possibly he was injured from a wave or a bird. But sadly, I found him dead shortly after taking this footage. The fact that sandhoppers do just as well on land as in water is remarkable. Very few animals are skilled in this way, but beaches and tide pools are the perfect environments to encourage this type of evolutionary change. The beach itself, after all, is a transitional habitat. You've got the full-on water from the actual ocean. You have shallow pools, you have super wet sand, you have sort of wet sand, and then you have dry sand and dunes, and then eventually you have people's backyards. When you have a nice ecological gradient like this, populations of animals can actually get split and speciate. One group of the population evolving towards a more land-like lifestyle, and the other maintaining its aquatic lifestyle. And that's exactly what we see happening with these sandhoppers. Biologists call this peripatric speciation. A small group of a larger population ends up going into a new ecosystem, no longer interbreeds with the old population, and so the two evolve on different trajectories. As mentioned earlier, sandhoppers don't jump with their legs, instead they use their little shrimp-like tails. These tails originally evolved for swimming, and they still use them for swimming when they're playing in the water. But on land, when startled, their tails just spaz out, tossing the animals upward, to as high as at least one foot in the air, 
by my estimation. For those of you that don't like measuring things in feet, that's about 30.48 centimeters. This is a perfect example of a powerfully effective exaptation. An exaptation is when an old trait is repurposed for a new function, one for which it did not originally evolve. In this case, a strong swimming appendage, the tail, is used as a spring to evade land predators, and evade it does. Because of the way that they jump, so fast, so far, and in a fairly uncontrolled random pattern, they are extremely difficult to catch. Unless, of course, you just dig a hole and kind of herd them into it, which I wish I had thought of earlier, because I spent about an hour before I was finally able to catch a single sandhopper that was large enough to really see on camera. Most of the critters I caught were only a few millimeters long and really hard to keep in focus. After a little practice, however, I discovered a sandhopper hunting trick. The bigger ones, and by big I mean they're still only about half a centimeter long, the bigger ones can only jump about 30 times before they have to stop and take a breather. And so if you just chase one long enough, it will eventually let you pick it up. No qualms whatsoever. The hard part, of course, is actually keeping track of a single individual for 30 whole jumps. They are almost perfectly camouflaged. The species of sandhopper that I found in Oregon, I'm told, is a Megalorchestia californiana. They come in a variety of colors, but I only found gray and speckled, unfortunately. But... Megalorchestia californiana seems to like being on land more than it likes being in the water. At least that was true for the few that I caught. But they do still enjoy seawater and they appear to need it in order to survive because I was not able to find any sandhoppers in the dry sand and especially not in the dunes higher up on the beach. Quick little side note, I did however find this beautiful little succulent blooming in the dunes. Succulents normally grow in deserts. The Oregon coast is not a desert, but water falls through sand so quickly that it might as well be. So, anyway. During the day, sandhoppers dig burrows and hide. And they do this so that they don't get eaten. And they do it so they don't dry out in the sun. They'll also sometimes just hide in clumps of seaweed, which is also a source of food for them. There are a lot of predators on the beach, especially birds. While Oregon sandhoppers appear to be stuck at the water's edge, they still need it in order to survive, there is a species in Australia, and now, thanks to international shipping, they have begun invading parts of California. There is a species of amphipods that most people call lawn shrimp. Why? Well, remember when I said that sandhoppers are a perfect example of a transitional species? On one end of that transition, we have their fully aquatic cousins, and on the other end of that transition, we have lawn shrimp. Lawn shrimp are land animals. They live in leaf litter and in damp soil like that often found in overwatered lawns. If you happen to have a lawn shrimp infestation in your own backyard, you see what I did there? Tied it all together nicely, huh? If you happen to have a lawn shrimp infestation in your own backyard and you want to get rid of them, you have two options. Option number one, just let the grass dry out for a bit. They will quickly leave in search of a slightly wetter environment. Maybe your neighbor's yard, for example. Or option number two, and this is the evil one, you can, if you want, just flood the place. This works because even the lawn shrimp clearly evolved from beach-dwelling ancestors, and those beach-dwelling ancestors clearly evolved from fully aquatic ancestors, Modern lawn shrimp, because they've been living on land for so many generations, they will drown in standing water. So there you have it. Crystal clear, undeniable evidence for evolution in your own backyard. Beach edition. So long for now. Stay curious. And also, eh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I am at the tide pools at the Oregon coast, and this is fresh water coming from a little stream coming in to a tide pool here. What I want to show you, it's really neat, the water is actually staying separate. There's uh, fresh water on top and salt water on the bottom. And the, the top, maybe five inches is fresh water, and underneath that is salt water. And you can actually see, as I disturb, 
the line between the fresh water and the salt water, you can actually see that. You see that? That is amazing. Just slight differences in chemical makeup and the water doesn't want to mix. After making this observation, I spoke about it with a limnologist, and he told me that my explanation for why this is happening was actually wrong. It's not the chemical differences between salt water and fresh water, in this case, that are preventing them from mixing. Instead, it's the temperature difference. Seawater in Oregon is extremely cold. We got a nice cold current coming in from the north, and the fresh water in this case was about 10 degrees warmer. And we all know that hot air rises, right? Well, the same is true, of course, for water. And because the warm water is pouring in on top of the cold water, and because the warm water is pouring in so gently, it's just not mixing. It's staying on top, just sitting there, floating on the colder water below. <laughs> the physics here is just fascinating.